Hello and welcome to lesson one on forensic psychology, top-down offender profiling. So in this session, we are going to look at the top-down approach, including organized and disorganized types of criminals. Now, before we go any further, if you haven't read the guide notes already, please go back and read the guide notes. All of this will make more sense if you do that. So pause the video and do that now. Do it, go, go, okay. Brilliant, so we're gonna look at top-down approach and you already have some idea of what that is. Some key terms though, let's define it. Offender profiling really refers to working out the characteristics of the offender by analyzing features of the crime and the crime scene. The whole point of offender profiling is to predict future uh, behavior or victims or crimes that may be committed. So we're really interested in generating evidence that we can then use to make predictions about. The top-down approach is sometimes also called the FBI approach, primarily because it was pioneered by the FBI, and involves an analysis of previous crime scenes, uh, which helps us create a profile of the likely offender in that case. The profile uses uh, knowledge to narrow down the potential suspects and differs from bottom-up in a, a number of ways. When we get to bottom-up, you'll see the, the main differences. So the procedure, it's a five step procedure. Step one, profiling inputs. Step two, decision processing. Step three, crime assessment. Four is criminal profile. And then five is use in investigation. You need to know each of these in detail, have examples for all of them and be able to apply them. Remember next lesson we're actually gonna apply this to a real crime that actually occurred with a number of, of victims. So you need to know the different steps. Profiling inputs then. The aim here is to collect as much data relating to the crime as possible. So it's autopsy reports, it's photographs of the crime scene, it's videos actually now quite commonly, uh, reconstructions, witness statements, police reports, any raw piece of data that might be relevant uh, in the uh, crime. So that's step one. Step two over here, decision processing. This is where we determine whether the crime can be located within behavioral categories. And these behavioral classifications are very similar to those that we see in the sort of DSM. And that's uh, if they have all these characteristics and they have OCD, if they have all these and they have depression. We're doing the same thing here with crime though. We're saying if a murder has these characteristics, it's this type of murder. If it has these, it's this. So some of the main classifications we use are murder type, there are three. Oh, you didn't know this, no doubt, that there are spree killings, there are serial killings, and there are mass killings, okay? These all involve multiple uh, victims, but each of them have a slightly different definition, which is in your guide notes. We look at the motive, and the motive could be multiple, um, multiple motives, but is it primarily about sex? Is it about fin uh, financial gain? Is it about revenge? Is it about, um, is it just, satiation of psychopathic desires these are all motives that we try to sort of unpick time factors when did did the crime take place uh, how long was the crime um, occurring for how long did the was the murder involved with the victim for example and then geographic uh, factors which we'll see in bottom up as well where was the crime uh, located and you know features of the actual environment the scene was the body moved and so forth so decision processing really important then we get to essentially the hallmark of top-down approach which is to organize the crime in one or two categories and really what we're saying here is we have an organized type of offender and a disorganized now the organized type of offender plans the crime meticulously sort of driving to the location taking the body kidnapping from one scene and dragging it to another hiding the the weapon we see evidence of violent fantasies usually leading up to the crime and during uh, offenders tend to be highly intelligent these are your your psychopaths but your your hannibal lectors your highly articulate intelligent uh, clever sort of criminals they're socially and sexually competent, so they may have partners. Uh, they don't have um, uh, 
and you wouldn't necessarily know that these sort of highly articulate, intelligent people were criminals, you'd have no inkling. You might work with them and think they're highly competent. Um, they may follow their crimes in the media and this gives them pleasure and satisfaction to see the case unfolding. The disorganized type is completely the opposite. They're impulse driven. Uh, they have these unplanned crimes, crimes of passion and, and instinct. Um, random selection of victim, whoever tends to be in the particular vicinity. Um, interestingly, sexual acts are not built on previous uh, fantasies planned around that particular victim. They tend to be performed on the body uh, post-mortem. The crime scene is likely to contain many clues uh, because, as we said, it's unplanned. They haven't uh, put a lot of effort into sort of hiding their intent and so forth. So these are the two types. Then at four, we developed the criminal profile. This is the one where, you know, the, the profiler who sits down, he tells you that he's a white male between this age and that age. Some of the characteristics we try to work out from criminal profiling are things like the sex of, of the uh, perpetrator, the criminal, the offender, the age, the race, occupational skills, IQ, social interest, mental health, and family background. And then if you remember from the Mad Bomber, uh, in last lesson, these some sometimes small clues can give us an ind indication of race, age, and so forth. Then we've got five, investigative use. So we have this criminal profile. What do we actually do with it? Well, here we produce this massive report and it identifies the likely profile of the offender. Uh, this can be used then to narrow down suspects or look for suspects in the first instance. And it can also be used to develop an interview strategy. So if we find out there's white male between sort of 35 and 50, that narrows it down. We don't have to go around uh, arresting teenagers or black men or whatever. Once we have the profile as well, we can start to develop an interview uh, technique. And that is that if they're organized, we may use a very different technique to a disorganized. Uh, and we'll come across this in next lesson and you'll see what I mean um, when we look at next lesson. Okay, so there's an example at the following web link of top-down uh, profiling, which you can go to. This is optional, but it will help consolidate your understanding. Evaluation then. It's a useful method. So Copson argues, as you know from the guide notes, there is a useful method. The majority of police officers say that they uh, found it helpful. However, a more scientific approach would be to evaluate the effectiveness of it by measuring the apprehension rate. So you said he was a white male in his 30s. We arrested a white male in his 30s. Therefore, the method is valid. Otherwise, there's no real way of measuring that this isn't just... Um, feels like it's working even though it may not. Basis of the method arguably is flawed. The idea of disorganized, organized. So one major limitation here is that this distinction was developed from um, interviews with highly intelligent deceivers, you know, serial killers, murderers, people who had lied and practiced liars and all these sorts of things. And there is a sense that they could have been feeding the the interviewer exactly what they felt the interviewer wanted to mark characteristics, or they could have just been playing around and lying about their own uh, behavior. Many of the criminals involved did lie about the number of people that they killed and the ways they were killed and all sorts. So fundamentally, we are trusting a group of people who have demonstrated their untrustworthiness in this arena. Uh, if you want to see this at work, follow the link and watch Ted Bundy. Um, it's terrifying. It is absolutely terrifying how lucid and in control this man is and how he could have easily manipulated any interviewer on the subject. In contrast is Charles Manson, who does not demonstrate um, lucidity in the same way. But if you just compare it to Ted Bundy, very, very sort of off the wall, but still highly manipulative. Is he sincere in what he's saying? I doubt it. Then, one of the big issues is that it may cause potential harm. And we have the Barnum effect. The Bar 
So the Barnum effect was applied to astrology originally. And uh, essentially the methodology goes like this. You can see the study or uh, John Stossel's replication of the study at the following link. The idea goes like this. I generate a, an astrological uh, profile of a particular star sign. I change the star sign and write all your individual star signs on yours. I hand them out and I ask you to say how close they are uh, to matching you. Overwhelmingly, people say, yes, it speaks to me. That describes me perfectly when, of course, it couldn't because it's the same profile that everyone gets. This can happen with offender profiling where they're so vague. It could pretty much apply to anyone. Think about this. Um, adult male, white, um, early 30s, uh, bald. Um, who could that apply to? Well, just think about your school alone. I, I can think of two, three Three people that apply to straight away, really general, and that's just physical descriptors. Imagine behavioral and emotional ones as well. So the Barnum effect is a major limitation of this. Another is measuring accuracy. We've already mentioned that in order to be effective, we would need the profiler characteristics to match up with the offender characteristics when they're finally apprehended. This is not often measured. Distinguish and organise and disorganise, it may not actually be a, distingu a distinguished category. And David Cantor carried out research in 2004 that suggests that a better technique might be to assess the personality differences rather than the characteristics of particular crimes. He argued that in his study, these characteristics of these categories didn't exist, um, at least in the 100 serial killings that he investigated. So application, I mean, you guys don't use application as much and examiners love it, it's a great source of evaluation. According to the Guardian article, which you'll find at this link, um, psychological profiling may be worse than useless. Read the article, pick out some key facts, chuck them in your guide notes, it would be really useful. Minimising information overload though. So one strength is that it can help minimise it. If you take the Yorkshire Ripper inquiry, 268,000 profiles generated or, or potential uh, suspects that needed to be uh, interviewed, you need to narrow that down somewhere. At least if you can say, well, we're looking for a white man so we can ignore the blacks and the Asian men um, in that case. We're looking for a man mid 30s all right so we don't have to go to all the nursing homes and find all the old men these characteristics can help us narrow these down to some extent um good just another one on the barnum effect does this sound familiar are you single white young female student highly intelligent very meticulous seems normal has a job with the exception of have a job single and possibly seems normal that pretty much applies to everyone. And most of you will fit in those other categories as well. That is all we have time for in this section then. So we have covered a top-down approach, the distinction between disorganized and organized crime. And we've looked at some of the evaluations such as the Barnum effect. What I'm gonna do now is I'm actually going to continue on with uh, an extension which is about becoming a profiler because I know a lot of you are interested in this but if you are happy with what we have covered finish the video there do something with it uh, make some cue cards uh, answer some exam style questions whatever it may be and don't forget the quiz that is present on the google form page complete that quiz it will give me a, an overview of which areas you found easy and which you didn't Thank you very much for listening as always and I will see you next time. So you want to be a criminal profiler? Well, good luck. Because in 1995, a survey was done of those in the UK that considered themselves criminal profilers. Of all the professionals surveyed, only 29 were classified as criminal profilers. So it's a, a bit of an exclusive club. What are the primary professions of these uh, eclectic group? This eclectic group, we have five academic psychologists, those are PhD um, academics, 
four clinical, uh, six forensic. We have three therapists, four police officers, one police scientist, and a police data system analyst. And this one may be the most important. I'll tell you why in a minute. So qualifications, what do you need to become a profiler? Well, psychiatric qualification is useful. Uh, these are medical doctors who specialize in psychiatry. Psychologists tend to have both undergraduates and postgraduate degrees. And police profilers tend to have a degree in psychology at postgraduate level. Um, the future of profiling. So it's hard to get into, it's rare. There are very few CSI uh, types. But the future is data. So um, terrorist profiling is one really interesting emerging field. It's something I'm quite interested in and I might do a geek lecture on it. Um, there's a good link here, Psychology at Day on Terrorist uh, Leader Profiling. That's well worth your time if you're interested in politics or history or um, those other subjects. Analysis of big data is the future. So can you trawl through, can you write programs that trawl through Facebook data and collect patterns of interactions? That's where all the profiling is uh, now and will be in the future because this is data, we're in a data rich environment. Um, and it may be that certain crimes have certain online profiles. And here is another link to a, uh, uh, a lecture by Professor Glenn D. Wilson, who is an absolute one of the key figures as well, along with David Cantor. It's an audio that's worth a, a listen to in your own time. Um, I got a lot out of this lecture. So he talks about his, his experience profiling. And that is it. Um, thank you for staying with the extension. If you have any questions about this, uh, what you can study at university, uh, what you can do with your life, uh, come and ask me and I'll see if I can help. As always, thank you very much.